Hi, this is David Gilmore, and welcome to my podcast. In June 2019, I will be auctioning more than 120 of my guitars for charity. This might be the most important collection of rock instruments ever. After all, in the end, they're tools of the trade. It's a guitar. <laughs> and on this podcast, discover the untold stories around three of them. There has been no real improvement since this was made in 1954. I'd be as happy to play this electric guitar as any other electric guitar. This is Three Different Ones, a David Gilmore podcast. Episode three. So what guitar are we are we ending with? What have you got next? You just uh, this is um, a white Fender Stratocaster, made in 1954, with sort of gold bits on it. It had gold tuning pegs on it. They don't seem to be on it anymore. But gold scratch plate, gold plate on the back with 001 on it, white Stratocaster. Um, which I've had since 1978. It was made, as I say, in 54. And the guy is a friend of, of, of Leo Fender's called Rex Galleon, um, who was a friend of Fender's and um, gave uh, Leo Fender advice. And he was the guy who suggested the scalloping out of the, the Stratocaster body and the shaping of it so that it would better fit someone's frame as they were playing it. I don't know what his frame was like. Maybe a bit like mine. Um, anyway, it was a very good idea, and um, Leo Fender gave him this guitar in around 54, 55, something like that, I guess. It's a very, very beautiful instrument. But he was a Gibson man, it turns out, and so he didn't really play it very much at all. And eventually sold it, I believe, uh, in order to buy a tape recorder. And uh, it was then in the window of a store somewhere in California and um, was bought by a guy to give to his son for Christmas when he was 12. And um, anyway, the years went by. Mysterious things happened. And um, in 78, I got it. Um, and here it is. So it is actually as good a strat as I've ever played. This is beautiful. This is the yeah. The um, you know, uh, for me, there is uh, there has been no real improvement in the making of the electric guitar since this was made in 1954. I'd be as happy to play this electric guitar as any other electric guitar. Um, and of all the other ones I've looked at and been asked to try over the years, how do you improve on perfection? Well, this is it. I was thinking about this. How many other pieces of objects, you know, say you, you talk about guitars as being workhorses, objects that you play. How many other objects, be that cars or dishwashers or whatever is the design so perfect yeah that it doesn't change at all in over half a century well you know cars um the romantic view of the cars and those roaring old engines and stuff great but you get in a modern one god it's a relief and when you want them to stop they stop when you want them to go around a the corner they go around that corner you know abs brakes all the safety things airbags they're just so much better not quite as much fun mm -hmm. but but i honestly don't really think that applies to something like this i mean does it get better than this leo fender just got it right yeah
What's the Floyd connection then? What what pieces of music did you did you write or perform? Um, I haven't. I don't think it's written anything that I can remember that I can think of. It may well have done. I think it's the rhythm guitar on another brick in the wall. I heard that. No. Because it's reasonably no. common for, for musicians to name be a, a Lucille or Blackie yeah. or whoever. No, I, I, I've never quite done that, no. Why not? Um, Tools of the trade, mate. Um, I, I, I guess I have a different form of romanticism. Has anyone ever tried to steal that one? Has, I mean, does it, does it travel under lock and key? Does it get its own plane seat? Um, well, it doesn't really travel. Right. So, you know, it, it moves from this studio to a studio in another house or in the house or something, but um, not great distances and usually just gets chucked in the boot of the car. And... Seriously? Yeah. It, it's... No, there's, um, it, it's, there's no massive security around it, no more than any other guitar. It is, there's... I'm, I'm lucky. It hasn't, hasn't been filched yet. Is it insured? Um, Phil, is it insured? I've no idea. <laughs> I don't know if it's insured or what it's insured for or anything. It's probably covered by an, an insurance policy, but uh, probably not in the, in, in the way that you might think it is. We should probably talk about the rest of the auction because the scale of it isn't yeah. just the guitars we've been covering mm. in this podcast. There are some other beautiful instruments. Are there? A, what would be one that you're that you're going to be sad to part company with? Well, you know, the, the obviously the two acoustics that we've talked about. You know, the six string Martin and the twelve string Martin are ones that I have a great affection for. Um, the Gibson Gold Top. 55 that's on another brick in the wall but there's a lot of guitars here um they've you know they're my friends they've been very good to me a lot of them have gifted me a piece of music and you just you have no idea which one is going to donate what to the canon at any given moment i have no idea how that works or and a lot of them have earned their keep in, in that they have given me a song. Um, a lot of guitars, you know, give you that song immediately. I mean, there's a, there's um, there's a, the Ovation six string, which uh, they, they, I think we got some of those in 1976 because they had integral electronics, um, which up till then were kind of rare. Um, and, you wouldn't want to take this Martin six string or that twelve string and and tamper with it to the extent of building electronics into it. Um, so when Ovation came out with these guitars that had built-in electronics, it was a 
great thing. Um, and one of those ovations, six string ovations, after hearing about something called a high strung, which people used to double an acoustic with a high strung. So you'd play one track with an acoustic, one with a high strung, to richen the sound. Someone who was working on an album in Abbey Road told me there was this thing. I had no idea. They didn't know what it meant, what that tuning meant, how it worked. Um, but I thought I'd give it a whirl. So I did it for myself by selecting strings, putting the first two strings, the top E and the top B, were standard. The next three strings were an octave higher than they should be. The G string was a very high, thin 008 or 009 gauge string, I can't remember. And the bottom string was two octaves high, so it was the same as the top string. So you had a top E at the, at the bottom and the top. And that created a sound that I very much liked. Um, and it meant that you could lazily leave a finger off. You could play an open D chord without damping the bottom string like you have to on a guitar because that big E chunking out in the middle of a D chord ain't going to happen. But if you if it's two octaves high, it becomes becomes the ninth note of a, of a D scale. So um, it created a lovely sound, which I then wrote what became Comfortably Numb on. Um, that's guitar has remained in that tuning and has been used I think pretty much for every live performance of Comfortably Numb since it was written everyone? I I might have to check but I would think pretty much everyone yeah it's still I mean on my last tour it still was being used for that Do you ever lend these guitars to anyone? Does anyone ever go? Do you think we could we could borrow zero zero one? Does that ever happen? Um, I've never <laughs> Would you do lent it? Zero zero one guitar out. I don't know if I've been asked, but I've lent all sorts of other guitars out. Yeah, oh, to to friends. Yeah, they give them back. <laughs> um, I mean, how do you think you are going to feel? I I sense, I sense there is a dichotomy here. How are you going to feel when you when you're in the auction house, and you see these instruments in front of you and you see the money being bid how is that going to make you feel do you think i well obviously there's going to be a sort of a, a dual feeling of um, a little bit of a loss but a huge sense of relief as well in that i don't have to think about what's going to happen to them in the future it's you know i've had my bit i've had my time with them um, I'm finding new friends now and they can move on um, and they will do an enormous amount of good so uh, I'm, I'm you know I I don't think it's something I'm going to have to struggle with in a major way I, I think don't think I'm going to have to go and see my shrink for weeks and months and years to to um, to deal with this I think oh yeah if, if if I was a psychologist which I clearly am not one interpretation would be well, is this severing a link to Pink Floyd is this kind of well that part of my no, music you're not a good psychologist <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I that stuff just doesn't doesn't enter my sphere you know just phew, it's gone I can't imagine you enjoy being asked this, but do you have any future plans for Pink Floyd to get back together? Yeah, the inevitable question. Thanks, Matt. Um, we don't have any plans right now. It's still Nick and me, I suppose you could say, we're on some sort of extended hiatus. But you know, one day in the future, who knows? Never say never.
And finally, what's next? Um, aside from this auction, are your are your your eyes set on a new musical horizon? What? Um, you know, I'm, I'm I I write bits of music. I work. I haven't done much lately, but um, other things in 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 my life are tidying up a little bit. One might say at the moment. Clear space is coming up to me, um, and um, I will be getting into this studio we're sitting in at the moment and, and listening to the hundreds of little bits of demos that I've got and, and, and developing them, seeing where they go, and, and seeing if I get my appetite back to start recording a proper album and, and, and doing all the stuff that goes with it. Because um, entering, entering into that is sort of like, for me at least, a f- about a four-year project. The writing, the refining, the recording... Marketing of an album and doing a tour, preparing a tour, rehearsals, getting the musicians, all that shit takes takes a lot of time. And I usually find at the end, it's taken me about four years to do the whole thing. So it's it's a it's a commitment, which I have as yet to make. But uh, we'll we'll probably get there. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. That was the final episode of Three Different Ones, a David Gilmore podcast. If you want to find out more about the David Gilmore Guitar Auction, just go to davidgilmore.com. This has been a Cup and Nuzzle production. Mm-hmm.